All right, Luke Acts for beginners. This is lesson number four. Jesus in Galilee, public ministry begins, his public ministry begins, part two of this section. And we will cover Luke chapter six, beginning in 6, 17 to chapter eight, verse three. So Luke continues his narr uh, narrative by describing key elements in Jesus' ministry as Jesus begins to preach and do miracles in the northern part of Israel. So we've talked about that part of his ministry in the last couple of weeks. He lived as an adult in Capernaum in the region of the Sea of Galilee. And of course it was only normal that he not only begin his ministry there but also call his apostles from the towns and villages in and around the area where he lived. Now in the last section that we covered, uh, Luke describes the choosing of the 12 apostles. That's Luke 6 verses 12 to 16. Luke follows the naming of the 12 with a summary of the teaching that Jesus gave after the selection of his apostles. Now remember I told you, I always give you ahead of time the section to read because we don't read everything in class, we don't have time and this is uh, this is an example of that, chapter 6, 7 to uh, 17 to 38, we won't read that. Uh, but this section is basically a repetition of what Matthew provides in a larger and more complete way. Uh, we call it the Beatitudes section, you know, Matthew chapter 5 all the way to Matthew chapter 7. So Luke picks some of that material and he repeats it in this section here. Uh, this passage demonstrates how different gospel writers borrowed material from each other in order to complete their records. Then in chapter 6, verses 39 to 45, Jesus also adds several parables here in His teaching in order to amplify and provide concrete examples for His previous teaching. So He does some of the Beatitudes, blessed, blessed is the, uh, the man of peace, and so on and so forth, and then He adds Proverbs uh, at the end of this. Note also that Luke places, uh, not Proverbs, parables rather, he puts parables of the house built on the rock at the end of his passage in the same way that Matthew puts you know, the house built on the rock at the end of his passage. And so they borrowed stuff from each other and they positioned it in such a way uh, to make their case for Jesus. So we're going to pick up our reading in chapter number seven beginning in verse uh, one. When he had completed all his discourse in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum. So Luke naturally ends this teaching section by noting where Jesus is geographically, so that his reader, Theophilus, will not only know what Jesus is saying and doing, but also where these things are taking place in order to ground them into some historical and physical context. Remember I told you at the beginning the thing about Luke, the historical gospel, he's really interested in making sure that Theophilus knows the history and the geography of where these things are taking place. It's not a myth, it's not a fairy tale, this is history and that's what he's writing and the way that he kind of confirms this is by putting in informa historical information and geographical information. So we noted that Jesus' ministry was a series of teachings followed by miracles that drew attention to His teachings, which were then followed by more miracles until the final miracle, which would be the resurrection, was performed. So Luke notes another miracle which was unusual because of its recipient, and that is in chapter seven. Now historically, we know that the region we refer to as Israel today was under Roman rule at that time. The Romans permitted a limited form of a, a kind of a self-rule with local Jewish kings who were appointed to manage you know, political and social affairs under the direction of the Roman governor. I mean, the Romans were in charge. They just allowed the Jewish kings and governors you know, to, to kind of do their uh, to do their job. The Roman governor, Pilate, who commanded the soldiers posted in Jerusalem as well as other key locations throughout the country in order to maintain the peace. So, so long as there was order, so long as there was peace, so long as the taxes were being collected, they left you alone. The moment there was trouble, they had enough soldiers there to take care of business and uh, take over direct control. The, um, 
Headquarters of, uh, for the Roman forces in Judea was in Caesarea, which was on the coast of the uh, Mediterranean uh, Sea. Uh, the Roman army, um, they had legionnaires. Legionnaires were the infantry soldiers that made up the bulk of the Roman army. They were recruited from Roman citizens. They were free citizens. Uh, interesting fact, the minimum height, four feet 11, which shows you that people were not as tall as they are today. Four foot 11, minimum height. And uh, they were recruited between the ages of 14 and 19 years uh, of age. Um, a legion had 6,000 soldiers, and by 23 AD, Rome commanded 23 of these legions. Uh, a legion, 6,000 soldiers, a cohort, 600 soldiers, a century, 100 uh, soldiers, and so you have the term a centurion. So a centurion commanded a company of about 100 legionnaires. They were called legionnaires and not soldiers. So let's, uh, there's a little bit of background on uh, Roman presence there at that time. So we pick it up in verse two, it says, and a centurion's slave who was highly regarded by him was sick and about to die. So according to Josephus, uh, Josephus a historian, a Jewish historian of the time, there were no Roman troops stationed in Capernaum in times of peace. So this centurion apparently lived in Capernaum, uh, probably worked for King Herod, because Herod had troops that were made up of foreign soldiers. Okay? He had a kind of a mix and match army a local army made up of mercenaries, Roman soldiers, people from other nations, so on and so forth. Luke sets the scene by describing the favorite status of this household servant and the fact that he was near death. Matthew in his gospel says that the servant suffered from paralysis, Matthew 8, verse six. So let's keep reading, verse three. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders asking him to come and save the life of his slave. How interesting. Just this verse, what it reveals about this particular centurion. Um, first of all, uh, he was influenced by the witness of the others concerning Jesus, not having seen or heard Jesus personally. Um, he had both influence and favor among the Jews. Think about it now, here's a centurion, a Gentile, sending several Jewish elders, leaders, to ask for help on his behalf. And then of course we find out why in the next verse. Um, we also know that he really believed, he was a believer. He didn't ask that Jesus come and pray, or could you drop by and see what you could do? He specifically asked Jesus to come and save the life of his dying servant. He's very specific about what he wants Jesus to do, what his expectation is of Jesus. So he's a believer. So let's read uh, verses four and five. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly implored him, saying, he is worthy for you to grant this to him, for he loves our nation, and it was he who built us our synagogue. So Luke records the arguments of the Jewish elders on behalf of this uh, person. Note there's nothing said about the value and character of the slave. They don't argue for the slave. They don't say, well, the slave is a good slave and you know, he deserves and he's got a family and he's so young, too young to die. You know, nothing about the slave. No argument about the slave, yet it's the slave who is, who is ill. Only that, the only that the slave was highly regarded by this centurion. So the way the elders state their case assumes that Jesus can do this. And they assure the Lord that the centurion is worthy, not in the sense that he deserves a reward of some kind, but that compared to others that the Lord has blessed, this man is also worthy of consideration. So they verify the sincerity of the man's faith by describing him as one who loves God's people, even though he's born a Gentile, and proving his love for them and for God by building a house of prayer for them, or a synagogue. Synagogue, house of prayer, where the Jews gathered for prayer and worship and the reading of the scripture, um, and then would go to Jerusalem for the festivals. 
Uh, let's keep reading in verse six to eight. It says, now Jesus started on his way with them and when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself further for I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. For this reason I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to this one go, and he goes, and to another come, and he comes, and to my slave do this, and he does it. Uh, so, so far we've only heard about this man's situation, his piety, his love, and his faith, but in this passage, we hear the centurion speak, and in his speaking we learn several more things about this very unusual man. For example, we learn that he is pious. He's a pious man. Piety is a, is a lost virtue in our society. In our society, the highest virtue is cynicism. <laughs> We're cynical about anything that is big, the government, the leaders, the, the, we're cynical. We're always trying to find a weakness. We're, we, we rejoice in the fall of the great. It doesn't matter if it's a, somebody in sports or politics, religion, oh, that's a special juicy one when that happens. There, but piety, that's not something that we that we pursue. I think, I, I think if you ask just the man on the street, you know, define the word piety, it would, not, it would not even click. Today the man on the street can tell you all the heroes in the Avengers or, in the, or who's at Comic-Con, you know, and <laughs> all that business, the plot lines of Wonder Woman and Aquaman, you know, they know all of that stuff. But I wouldn't have a clue as to what piety is all about. Piety is a respect for godly things and godly people. That's what piety is in a nutshell. In his case, this man's case, he respected the fact that Jesus, as a Jew, could not enter his house without defiling himself, meaning becoming <clears throat> excuse me, ceremonially unclean according to Jewish law. There's piety, recognizing that the thing that you've asked a person to do would compromise them religiously. Seeing that Jesus is about to do so, he sends friends to stop him. I mean, he wanted his slave healed, but not at the expense of putting Jesus in a compromising position by openly violating the law, because that's what he would be doing if he entered the Gentiles' home. I mean, Jesus already had enough trouble with people for you know, healing people on the Sabbath and associating with, quote, sinners. Now he was going to walk right into a, a Roman centurion's house? Wow, that was big trouble, big time. We also find out that he is a humble person. Humility, basically, is having a realistic evaluation of ourselves. Basically, that's what humility is. This man recognized that Jesus' power was from God and greater than his own that came from man. And thus he placed himself in the correct position before Jesus, asking him to exercise that power, in other words, say the word, in order to heal his servant. So let's keep reading verse nine. Now when Jesus heard this, he marveled at him and turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. Rarely does Jesus marvel at what men or women do. But here he does so because this Gentile fully grasped the concept that Jesus' power was embodied in His word. I mean, the apostles were still bumbling around. They, they, were, you know, they were seeing the miracles and they still didn't get it. And this centurion understood that his power was in his word. Just say the word, he says. An idea that the Jewish nation, having had God's word for nearly 1,400 years, had failed to accept until that moment. Still were rejecting that idea. And this Gentile soldier 
got it, understood it. So Luke notes that at this moment, the slave was fully healed. So as if to confirm that the power is in Jesus' word, Luke follows up the healing of the centurion slave, you know, the miraculous healing of the centurion slave, with an even greater miracle, that is the raising of the dead. So Luke quickly sketches out the situation. Um, he again pinpoints the location of where Jesus is, Nain, which is a city southwest of Capernaum, and the scene, a funeral procession for the only child of a widowed mother. We don't, we don't do that anymore, you know, funeral processions. When I was younger, when I was a kid, I mean, in, even in Montreal, which was a big city, there was a funeral procession for several blocks, usually between the funeral parlor and the church, of course, being raised Catholic. I mean, at my own dad's funeral, I remember, they carried the coffin out, they put it in the hearse, and then we walked in the street, the two blocks, we had a, we had a procession, two blocks, walked in the street, myself, my mom, family, friends, you know, all the way to the church, and then they took the, you know, it may not be possible you know, to walk from uh, Eisenhower's up on 29th and Moore or something, <laughs> all the way to Choctaw. But anyways, I still remember there being funeral processions when I was, so this is, a few, he comes upon a, a funeral procession um, for a child of a widowed mother. In this instance, nobody asks him to intervene since the person's already dead wouldn't occur to them to ask him to raise this person from the dead. It is his compassion for the mother that moves Jesus to miraculously raise her son from the dead. So let's pick that up in verse 13. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, do not weep. And he came up and touched the coffin and the bearers came to a halt. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man sat up and began to speak and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Note that he only speaks the word to raise the dead man. And Luke confirms the miracle by noting that the one who was formerly dead began to speak. In verses 16 and 17, Luke describes the excited reaction of the crowd. I mean, <laughs> it's one thing to say, hey, I heard Jesus rose somebody, you know, brought somebody back from the dead. Yeah, he went to somebody's house. I don't know where it was, you know, but that's what I heard. That's one thing, but in the middle of the funeral procession where everybody's, everybody's in agreement that the person is actually dead, those days no, no closed coffins, they just carried the person. You know. Everybody knew he was dead. Right there out in the open in front of everybody, this miracle takes place. So unlike the healing of the centurion slave done before just a few people and for the slave of a Gentile soldier, this spectacular miracle done before the crowd following him, his disciples and the crowd from the city in the funeral procession. There's a big difference. This is a very public miracle. So this particular miracle makes him famous. This one right here. Famous throughout the nation, not just in his hometown, and the surrounding area, and why wouldn't it? <laughs> why wouldn't it make him famous? So Luke is setting the scene for Jesus' eventual appearance in Jerusalem. His works you know, are preceding him. A healing over here, a teaching over there. Wow, spectacular, he, ra he actually raised somebody from the dead. So in Luke chapter seven, verse 18 to 35, uh, which we're going to uh, cover, uh, we need to remember in verse 16, Luke writes that the people were praising God on account of Jesus' miracle and they were saying that a great prophet had been sent by God. That's in verse 16. So Luke uses this statement as a bridge to summarize and close out the work of John the Baptist, who was the last prophet sent by God to the Jewish people. And the writers often did this. They'd pick a key word in the middle of a a narrative, they'd pick a key word, and then on that word they'd build a bridge to another idea. So the word prophet, uh, uh, Luke uses the word prophet uh, uh, to build a bridge in order to summarize the work of John the Baptist. So after this section, Luke will only mention uh, John's execution in chapter nine, verse seven to nine, or references to him by the apostles and Jesus. 
So in this section, Luke recounts a time when John the Baptist was in prison and he sent disciples to ask Jesus if he was really the Messiah. So let's read that in verse 18 and 19. The disciples of John reported to him about all these things. Summoning two of his disciples, John sent them to the Lord saying, are you the expected one or do we look for someone else? Now some are confused, wondering why would John doubt at this point? Why would he be doubting? All the miracles, everything taking place here, why would he doubt that Jesus is the Messiah? So John's task was to announce the coming of the Messiah and the judgment that the Messiah would bring. In Matthew 3 verse 10, for example, Matthew says, or John is saying, the ax is already laid at the root of the trees, therefore every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That was John's way of saying, the judgment is coming on you people. The judgment is coming on you people, you better get ready. So it seems that John believed that these two events would happen simultaneously. In other words, the coming of the Messiah and the judgment on the people, that would happen at the same time. He was under this impression. When John saw that despite his presence, in other words, despite Jesus' presence, there didn't seem to be any judgment on the people. In fact, the leaders were actually pronouncing judgment on Jesus and attacking him. John began to doubt and sent to the Lord for clarification and assurance. You know, it's like, well, wait a minute. Yeah, okay, you're doing the miracles. You know, you're doing all of this stuff but there's no judgment. So are you really the Messiah? You know, did, I, did I misunderstand something here? Of course we know, perfect hindsight, we know that the judgment on the Jewish nation did eventually come some 40 years later in 70 AD when Jerusalem, the city, was destroyed by Roman legions. The people killed, the temple destroyed. So the judgment did come, it just didn't come you know, exactly at the same time as Jesus' appearance. So we read verse 20, back to Luke. It says, when the men came to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, are you the expected one or do we look for someone else? At that very time, he cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind. And he answered and said to them, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. So Jesus in word and deed reassures them that he is the Messiah doing all the things, you know, the miraculous, the miracles, the teachings, the preaching of the gospel, all of that. He's doing all the things that the prophets said that the Messiah would do. He's doing them all. I find it interesting here is they ask the question and then Luke says, and then Jesus did all these miracles and then, and then he turns back around to them and say, yeah, you, you saw, you, did you just see what I've just done? Go back and tell John, you see? He, he doesn't just say, well, haven't you heard of the things that I've done? No, no, he goes ahead and continues to minister and you know, do miracles and healings. And then he talks to the ones that had been sent by John. So when John saw that despite, excuse me, uh, Jesus in word and deed reassures them that he is the Messiah, doing all the things that the Messiah was supposed to do. And he gives John an exhortation to rejoice in his faith regardless of his circumstances. And then in the last couple of lines of this, um, of this uh, section here, Jesus finishes by confirming the person and ministry of John the Baptist and condemning the Jewish leaders who rejected John, his baptism, and the Messiah uh, that he proclaimed. So uh, Jesus gives the messengers the message that yes, I am the one. Did you see everything I'm doing? And he also sends a message to John by telling the people, this John, who'd you expect to see? You know, somebody uh, in fine uh, clothing, somebody at ease. He's the greatest of the, pro in other words, he gives an attaboy to John. He confirms that John was who he was supposed to be, the one preparing the way. And so John receives confirmation and assurance from the Lord. So even though John had a moment of doubt about Jesus, the Lord encourages the people not to harbor any doubt about John, about his ministry, uh, or about himself. 
All right, so <clears throat> up until this time, aside from his earthly mother, Mary, and the prophetess Anna at the temple, and those that he healed, no women are prominently associated with Jesus. Uh, Luke changes this by introducing a woman who would anoint him and a group of women who would support him. So we begin with the, uh, what the Bible describes as the sinful woman, and this is in verse 36. It says, now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Again, notice, Luke situates the story, but this time socially. Where is he socially? Well, he's in the house of a Pharisee for a meal. Um, and so we understand what is taking place. Verse 37 to 38. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was uh, reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them, anointing them with the perfume. So the meal, as I think most of us know, was served on a low table, didn't have tables like us. The guests reclined on pillows, uh, leaning on their left elbows with their legs extended away uh, from the table. The woman, no name here, uh, in popular movies and that, uh, many like to you know, assign to her the name Mary Magdalene, but the Bible doesn't give her a name. And Mary Magdalene um, was a woman who was healed of a demon possession by Jesus. She wasn't, a, she wasn't a woman who was a prostitute and got, you know, Jesus, no, no, no. She, she was healed of, of demon possession. That, that's the connection that Jesus had with, or the initial connection that Jesus had with uh, Mary Magdalene. Um, it says that she was a, a sinner, but that doesn't mean that she was a prostitute. She could have been a sinner, you know, maybe she was a divorced woman who had committed a, adultery, she was a sinner. Maybe she was a thief. <laughs> you ever thought of that? Maybe she was a thief. You know, maybe she associated with the wrong persons, whatever. She was a sinner. And she enters and stands behind uh, Jesus and she begins to weep and then she kneels and breaks open. There's no cap on these vials, not like today, twist off. They didn't have twist off caps. So if you had this perfume, you had to break it open. Once open, it had to, it had to be used. Uh, it was anointing oil. The kind of oil, if you had a guest come in, you would use this oil, you wouldn't pour it on them, you'd pour a drop on the top of the person's head. That was simply uh, you know, polite, that was uh, hospitality, welping, uh, welcoming uh, the person uh, into your home. Um, so, but she takes the thing and she pours it on his feet. Uh, her tears fall on his feet while she is anointing them. And an interesting thing too, we see something about the Pharisee here. Since there was uh, uh, no basin or towel that was provided to wash his feet when he came in, another basic courtesy, there was nothing like that. What does the woman do? Well, she proceeds to dry his feet with the only thing she has, her hair. So she dries his feet with her hair and kisses them, a sign of humility, a sign of great love. So her actions were a great sign of humility. She crashed the dinner. She exposed herself to possible rejection and shame. She lowered herself before Jesus publicly. I mean, think about what she, what she did. I've seen churches, uh, excuse me, congregations, <coughs> and they do, they reenact the, uh, the uh, <coughs> they reenact the washing of the feet, and they'll get some of the elders up there <clears throat> with some of their gnarly feet, take off their socks and whatever, and as a, as a gesture, just to show you know, that we, we, we need to be servants in this and that, they'll have you know, some of the people come up and, and wash their feet, you know, a little sponge and a little towel, you know. and even then it's ugh, you gross. And you're sure, or you're hoping anyways, that the elders washed their feet that morning you know, in preparation for the little ceremony here. Can you imagine what this woman did? I mean, it's just amazing. You're amazed when you, when you think about it. In verse 39, 
It says, now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. So Luke, he inserts a kind of a caption you know, over the Pharisee's head there, showing his thoughts and thus exposing his intention and attitude toward Jesus. So he invited Jesus just to see what was said about him, if it was real, if it was true, to test him. No oil, no washing of the feet, no hospitality. So this episode merely confirmed what other Jewish leaders said. He eats with sinners and tax collectors. He can't be from God. He's not one of, he's not one of us. How can he be from God? He's not one of us because we'd never do that. Verse 40, and Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replies, say it, teacher. A money lender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and one 50. When they were unable to pay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. What an attitude this, this Pharisee had. I mean, you want to just smack him, don't you? What an attitude he's got. You know, go ahead, teacher. <laughs> if you can find the lowest term, that's, that's pretty much the one for a guy who's done miracles. Yeah, go ahead, teacher. And then Jesus says you know, his, his parable about the, the two debtors and he asks him a question. And how, look how he answers. Well, I suppose, you know, Mr. Smarty, well, I suppose the one, you know, that, that kind of belligerent, arrogant attitude, it, 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 it just oozes right out, of that, right out of that verse. So this parable exposes the hearts actually of both the Pharisee and the woman. One, the woman felt the weight of sin and the other Pharisee did not feel the weight of sin. That was the essential difference. We continue. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, uh, since the time I came in, has not ceased uh, kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Interesting to note that Jesus says that what the woman did was done as a result of her sins being forgiven. She did not anoint his feet and do all of this in order to receive forgiveness. She did all these things as a show of her love toward Jesus for having forgiven her. When? We don't know. But as John says, if everything you know, was written that Jesus did, you know, the, the world couldn't, couldn't hold all the books. So we don't know when she was forgiven, but she was already forgiven. This was her show of love. This was her show of gratitude. In contrast to this, the Pharisee had neglected to show Jesus the basic courtesies of Jewish hospitality, let alone love. So the parable simply lays out the very common sense idea that those who have been forgiven much are usually more grateful than those who think they have smaller debts. However, in reality, both the woman and the Pharisee owed a great debt for their personal sinfulness. The only difference was that she became aware of hers and the Pharisee didn't. And the result was that Jesus openly expressed before witnesses that the woman was actually forgiven and by his silence showed that the Pharisee was not. I'd feel a little queasy there if I was the Pharisee. He's declaring, wow, this woman's sins are forgiven. You're waiting, and yeah, that's it. Only hers are forgiven. So this declaration stirs up the other guests because in saying this, Jesus is equating himself with God the very thing that will seal his fate to the cross a little bit later on. We have a little bit more to do. Um, chapter eight, verses uh, one to three. These are the ministering woman. This is the woman that was forgiven. Now the ministering woman. So in the first three verses of chapter eight, Luke will once again revert to his practical mode 
by describing how Jesus was supported. Very practical, you know, how did he live? You know, where did he get his money? Now he's just described a man healing all kinds of diseases and infirmities, raising the dead, reading people's minds. I mean, is he for real? Is he human? That potential question or doubt is answered here where Luke explains that a group of female disciples provided the resources to eat and lodge and travel for both Jesus and his apostles. A very practical piece of information that people would have wanted to know at that time. All right, so a couple of lessons and then this lesson uh, is yours. Uh, uh, we'll keep on going next time. Luke is going to record another series of parables and miracles taking place in Galilee before Jesus will begin venturing south to go to Jerusalem and all the things that take place on that journey. But for now we'll shut it down here at uh, Luke 7. A couple of lessons. Lesson one. The prayers of the righteous are effective on behalf of other people, whether they're righteous or not. In prayer, the important thing is that you are righteous. Because you may be praying for someone who is not righteous. See what I'm saying? The elders appealed to Jesus on behalf of a Gentile, a centurion, a person they were not even supposed to deal with, let alone pray for. So praying for an unfaithful husband, or a friend in jail, or an unbelieving grandmother is made acceptable and effective because of our faith and our righteous life, not their faith, not their unrighteous life. Lesson number two, faith believes that God will find a way. The centurion could not bring his sick, dying slave to Jesus, and Jesus could not enter the centurion's house without defilement and the problems that this would cause his ministry. The centurion called on Jesus nevertheless, and God found a way to answer his prayer. In faith and in prayer, our job is to ask and to believe, not to figure out how God is going to do this. I hear prayers all the time for someone in particular and the person who is leading the prayer will then go and lay out what it is that God is supposed to be doing for that person. That would be wonderful if God would use my wisdom to carry out His will. But I have found in my life that He usually carries out His will using His wisdom, not mine. My job is to ask and to believe and to persist. His job is to figure out how. Okay, next assignment, reading Luke chapter eight, verse four, all the way to chapter nine, verse 50. That's our reading assignment for our next class. Thank you very much for your attention.